In our next lesson regarding the citric acid cycle from chapter 14, we want now to consider the Pasteur effect and how that relates to the citric acid cycle and also look at the regulation of the cycle. Remember it is a cyclic pathway. We start with oxaloacetate, we add an acetyl group, and by step 8 we've regenerated that oxaloacetate molecule. And so the pathway as a whole functions like a catalyst, that is we regenerate our starting material. The cycle runs constantly, but we need to be able to downregulate or upregulate the pathway according to the energy needs of the cell. The intermediates in this cycle are associated with other pathways, both catabolic and anabolic, and for that reason, because these intermediates are so key to the needs of the cell, the cycle needs to run continuously, and that's why it's cyclic in nature rather than linear. It's as if we had a room in a building that was in constant use, so we'd never completely turn off the lights, but we might, might be able, uh, we'd need to be able to adjust the lighting accord, according to the needs of those who are using the room. We can also see the catalytic nature of the cycle and its importance in aerobic metabolism by looking at the Pasteur effect. When the glycolysis and the transition step and the citric acid cycle all work together, they're all considered a part of aerobic metabolism. And that's because in each of these processes we produce reduced cofactors. Each of these can be reoxidized by eventually transferring those electrons to oxygen and that gives us quite a yield of ATP and that's illustrated on the far right of our figure here for a single molecule of glucose up to 32 molecules of ATP and for this reason it's considered a part of aerobic metabolism even though in the process we've, processes we've looked at thus far we haven't directly transferred those electrons to oxygen Still, they will eventually be transferred to oxygen and therefore they are part of aerobic metabolism. To see the distinction between anaerobic and aerobic metabolism, that is, in essence, the Pasteur effect. It refers to an experiment conducted by Louis Pasteur. He set up two identical flasks, and I've illustrated those for you at the bottom of the screen on the right here. They have identical amounts of nutrients and identical inoculation of bacterial culture. In one flask they were grown anaerobically in the absence of oxygen and as illustrated on the far right here one flask was grown in the presence of oxygen. What he found was that the flask of bacteria that grew anaerobically consumed a great deal more glucose than those grown with oxygen and we can see that by referring again to our figure here. Again, one molecule of glucose can give us up to 32 molecules of ATP, a lot of energy. However, if we grow anaerobically, all we can use is the glycolytic cycle, and remember that only gives us two molecules of ATP. So if we want to get to the same amount of energy, we're going to have to consume 16 times the amount of glucose to get the same amount of ATP. And that illustrates very profound differences between anaerobic and aerobic metabolism. Let's look at the regulation of the cycle. It is regulated at each of the three irreversible steps. Our first irreversible step is step one. Flux forward is dependent largely on substrate concentrations, and so it's more of a need to downregulate. In this case, it is inhibited by both citrate and succinyl-CoA. These are each examples of feedback inhibition. In other words, citrate will shut down its own synthesis. But remember, this will only be true if we're not utilizing the citrate. Otherwise, it will not build up its concentration. Likewise, succinyl-CoA concentration can only build if we're not using it for in subsequent steps, and it also acts as an inhibitor for step one. Step one is also inhibited by NADH. Remember this is one of the main products of the pathway. We produce three molecules of NADH for every turn of the pathway. If we're not reoxidizing those components and using those electrons, then we need to shut down the pathway until we can do so. Steps three and four are also inhibited by NADH. 
Step 4 is also feedback inhibited by succinyl-CoA. In other words, it shuts down its own synthesis if it's not used in subsequent steps and it, its concentration builds within the cell. We can also activate the pathway by turning on the enzymes that catalyze steps 3 and 4. They're both activated by the influx of calcium. Recall from chapter 10 that calcium will build within the cell in response to epinephrine. This is part of that fight or flight response. And so as calcium builds, it's going to stimulate the production of uh, more of these reduced cofactors in the citric acid cycle and give us more ATP energy and we need that as fuel to get away from BIVO. We can also activate step 3 by ADP. Remember that's a measure of the energy needs of the cell and so if ADP concentration is high then ATP concentration is low and we need to turn on the pathway. In our next video lesson from chapter 14, we want to see why this particular metabolic pathway is cyclic in nature. Along those lines, we want to see how the intermediates of the TCA cycle may be used in other biosynthetic pathways.